Hi, my name is Father Mike. <laughs> I'll start again. Okay, here we go. Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and this is Ascension Presents. So, um, the Pope, right? Not like our current Pope, but like the idea of the Pope is a, a, the reality of the Pope is a thing that a lot of times people don't understand, whether they're not Catholic and they're like, what the heck, what's the Pope? I don't think he's very important. Or they are Catholic and they're like, what the heck, what's with the Pope? I don't understand this whole thing. Because I think a lot of people buy into the idea that the papacy, is the way you say it, the, the, the Pope, the idea, the role of the Pope, is a thing that like the church invented. False, actually, it was invented by God himself in the same way that God invented the universe. Here's a long story. I'll start way back in the beginning, well, at the beginning, but early enough in the beginning to give you kind of a, a context for how it's very, very, very clear that Jesus establishes Peter as the first pope and that he expects not only Peter, but all subsequent subsequent uh, successors of Peter um, to be that role of the, the pope, the pope, the pope role. So it all actually kind of starts in many ways with the kingdom of Israel. Let's go way, 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 way back. Um, you have uh, Abraham, and he has a son, Isaac, who has a son, Jacob. Jacob, his name gets changed by God to Israel. Okay, so Jacob slash Israel has 12 sons. And uh, one of them is Joseph with his amazing technical dream coat. But they have the whole rest, right? And so at one point, after years and years and years, these 12 sons end up having, being the, 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 the names of the 12 tribes, right? So, so the, the tribes of Israel, so Israel slash Jacob, who has his 12 sons, those sons become like tribes, so the 12 tribes of Israel, because it's based off of the 12 sons of Israel slash Jacob, right? Okay, so um, this family, you know, this all these tribes coming together, they're made into a royal kingdom under one guy. His name is David. David brings all 12 tribes into one royal kingdom. Um, why? Because David is the anointed one, right? Remember Samuel, the prophet, goes to David as a... As a Jesse, his father, Jesse, um, and says, where are your sons? And he shows him all these sons. Not, not that one, not that one, not that one. Oh, David, anoint him. He's the anointed one. He is the Christos, right? Mishiach is, the, is the, the word, right? Christ, Messiah, means the anointed one. He's the anointed one that brings all 12 tribes into one royal kingdom. David establishes the kingdom. You have Solomon, who's David's son, still the king. Does pretty good, does pretty bad. The next, uh, the next son basically kind of breaks the kingdom because he's not a very good king. And so the kingdom of 12 tribes splits into 10 tribes in the north and two tribes in the south. And um, okay, that's how it is. That's how it is for uh, a while. And then Assyria comes in from the north and destroys those 10 tribes in the north. In that fact, they're lost to history. We have no remnant of them. There's no, uh, there's, they, they're never, re they're gone obliterated. Those 10 tribes gone. The only two tribes that are left are the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And then you have some, Le you know, people, descendants of Levites, of course. Years and years and years pass. And then here comes Jesus. Okay, so again, okay, I just did a lot of history in a very amount of, so short amount of time. But when Jesus comes on the scene, what's important for us to understand that he didn't just come to, um, he didn't just come to save us. I mean, he did come to save us, but not just to come to save us. He came to save us through a particular means. Yes, through the cross, uh-huh, but also through the kingdom, by reestablishing the kingdom. Why? How do I know this? Well, because think about this. Every time in Matthew's gospel, almost, I mean, gosh, in a lot of the gospels, but in Matthew's gospel in particular is very, very important because Jesus, his first words in uh, Matthew chapter 4, what does he say? It says, after he gets baptized by John in the Jordan, he goes out and does some battle with Satan in the wilderness, and he comes back to the north, to the Sea of Galilee. And his first words are, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now we hear that, like, oh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah, because that's just kind of a code word for like, I'm here, everyone, which, sure, fine, but no. <laughs> because Jesus came as the Christ, right? He's anointed. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. Baptized by John in the Jordan, Holy Spirit comes upon him, goes to the wilderness, comes back to the north. The kingdom is here. Why? Because the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Christos, is going to reconstitute the 12 tribes of Israel. He's there to bring them back together. He's, he's there to establish the kingdom. That's what everyone was waiting for when it came to the Messiah. And where does he do this? This is so incredible. He begins this in the north. What about the north? In the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the first two tribes of those 10 in the north that got obliterated. He starts right there with his first public ministry. What does he do? In the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, 
he starts calling two people. He says, okay, uh, Andrew and Simon, you come follow me. And then James and John, you come follow me. And how many people does he come call to come follow him like that? Um, there's many disciples, but there are how many apostles? Twelve of them. Why? Because Jesus is very clearly reconstituting the twelve tribes of Israel. He's there to clearly establish a new kingdom. So, in the old kingdom, there was a king. In the new kingdom, there is a king. His name is Jesus. In the old kingdom, there were the twelve tribes. In the new kingdom, there are the twelve apostles. In the old kingdom, there was a prime minister. In the new kingdom, there is a prime minister. If you flip ahead to Matthew chapter 16, you see what you, what you see is Jesus do. He goes up to Caesarea Philippi. And when he gets up to Caesarea Philippi, this place about 29, 30 miles north of Capernaum, which is around north of the Sea of Galilee. He asks his disciples, he says, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets, Elijah. Um, they're all wrong. And he says, but who do you say that I am? And Simon stands up and he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looks at Simon and says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My heavenly father revealed this to you. Therefore, I say to you, you are Kepha. You are rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it." Now, there's a whole thing about going to Caesarea and Philippi and calling, renaming Simon Rock and saying, upon you I'll build my church. Because if you ever go to Caesarea Philippi, it's pretty amazing. There is this massive rock upon which are built temples, uh, pagan temples. And so Jesus, because he didn't have PowerPoint back then, he had to bring them 29 miles north of Capernaum to have this visual demonstration for them of, here's what I mean when I say, Peter or Simon, now you are Rock. Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, in case you might be mistaken enough to think that I'm saying, hey Peter, you're a chip off the old block. False, because right behind him is a massive rock upon which are built temples, upon which are built churches. So it's very, very clear to all the apostles that Jesus is saying, I'll build my church upon you, Peter, used to be Simon, some of us would call you Simon Peter still. He goes on to say though, it's phenomenal, why does this have to do with kingdom? He goes on to say, he says, um, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Remember that word kingdom. Give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, if we were listening to it, like, wow, that's really cool. That's a lot of power. That's really interesting. Neat. Got the keys, like the key to the city. Well done, hometown boy. No, no, no. If you were one of the other disciples, one of the other apostles who were listening to Jesus speak to your buddy, who used to be named Simon, Simon, now his name is Kepha, his name is Peter, you'd be like, oh my gosh, Jesus, who's the Messiah, he's the anointed one, he's the king to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. He just made Simon Peter the prime minister. What do you mean? Because in the old kingdom, there was the role of the al Habait. I got this from my friend Jeff Cavins, who has I don't know, he's a channel on this, on this little channel too. Um, Jeff Cavins talks about this, the al Habait, which means over the house, the prime minister. So the role of the al Habait over the house, the prime minister, was when the king was away, the al Habait, the prime minister, had the authority of the king. And you can see this in Isaiah chapter 22 with this whole story about this guy named Shebna and Eliakim. If you read Isaiah chapter 22, um, Shebna was the previous al Habait. He was the previous prime minister and he did some not great things. And so the Lord said, no, I'm taking your role away from you, Shebna. I'm giving it to a guy named Eliakim. And here's how he describes the role of the al Habait. He says this, on that day, I will clothe him with your robe, gird him with your sash and give over to him your authority. Because this is the thing, the role of the al Habait is not a figurehead thing. It's not a prime minister who's just like stands there and doesn't have any power. Power. He has authority. That sash is a sign of authority, the robe is a sign of authority, and the word authority is a sign of authority. It goes on to say, he will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I love this. Jeff Kevin points, points this out. Kevin's points this out. He says, he'll be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. What do we call the, the Pope? We call him the Holy Father. In fact, even the word Pope comes from the Italian Papa. And then he says, I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one shall shut. When he shuts, no one shall open. So here's Jesus at Caesarea Philippi and he says, Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you bound on earth, bound in heaven. What you open on earth is open in heaven. Or loose on earth is, open, is loosed in heaven. Every one of those disciples were like, oh my gosh, Jesus just made Peter the al Habait. He just made Peter the prime minister. Peter now is in charge when Jesus will be gone. 
because he gave him that role. Why? Because this is not just about Jesus coming to save every one of us. Yes, that is about that, but he came to establish a kingdom. He came to establish a church, and in that church, it has a structure. And in that structure, there is the role of the prime minister who has real authority. What he binds on earth is bound in heaven. What he looses on earth is loosed in heaven. He goes on to say, I will, on him shall hang all the glory of his family. He will be a, like a peg in a sure spot to be a place of honor for his family. That's the role of the Holy Father. He's a peg in a sure spot. You know, there's so much confusion. There's so many different beliefs people have. are like, well, I think this about Jesus. I think that about Jesus. But the role of the al Habayit, the role of the Prime Minister, the role of the Pope that Jesus himself established is a peg in a sure spot. It's what unites all Christians. It's what united all Christians for a long, long time until recently. When I say recently, I mean 500 years for some, 1,000 years for others. But this is not something that the church made up. This is something that Jesus himself established. And did not on a whim in Matthew 16, but as part of his massive program to reestablish the kingdom of heaven on earth. Because the church is not some invisible, intangible kind of a thing. The church has a structure. Jesus is the head. He's the head of the church. And the body is not just this kind of wispy, amorphous nothing. It has a structure as well. And part of that structure is the apostles, meaning current bishops, and the al habait meaning the current pope. And part of the structure are, are the, bish the, the bishops, the successors of the apostles, and the pope, who is the successor of Peter, that first prime minister, that first al habait the great news is this is not actually meant to be a divisive thing. So for all my, all my friends who are, are non-Catholic Christians, for all my Orthodox friends who are, who are were, were separated, this is not meant to be divisive. In fact, it's the opposite. This was meant to be, by God, it's meant to be a sign of our unity. The role of the Holy Father, the role of the al Habayit, the role of the Prime Minister, was meant to be that peg in a sure spot that united the whole, it says, upon him the whole glory of his Father will rest. The whole glory of the kingdom would rest. The whole family would be united with this Prime Minister by the Pope. So the role of the Pope is meant to be a role of unity. So my invitation is, if you've never thought of this, if you're Catholic, you never thought about the fact that the Pope is meant to be a sign of unity, think about this. If, you, if you're non-Catholic and realize, wait a second, so the role of the Pope established by Jesus, not by some medieval church, but established by Jesus, is meant to be a sign of unity, then what's my relationship with the Pope? Is it possible that God is calling me to take another look at what I might have written off as being just in another invention, you know, what I would think of another invention of the Catholic Church, or is it possible that God's inviting me to say, wait a second, maybe the Pope is meant to be a sign of unity for me too. I think it's something worth praying about, something worth considering. From all of us here at Ascension Presents, my name's Father Mike. God bless you.